Okay, there we go. All right, sorry, thank you guys for waiting so patiently. Um, welcome to our 1230 press conference. This is about the two earthquakes in Mexico from earlier this year. So our panelists today are Jolie Perez Campos, Juan Manuel Espinosa Aranda, and Ross Stein. So I'll kick it off to Jolie. <coughs> Thank you very much for coming and good afternoon. So I'm going to give you a perspective from the uh, National Seismological Service, how we leave these two earthquakes. Next, please. Next one. Next slide. Yes. Thank you. So it, it was almost midnight on September 7 local time. Uh, it was 23.49. And um, we felt in Mexico City a, a strong shaking. Mexico City is more than 650 kilometers away from the epicenter in the Gulf of Tehuantepec. Uh, and this is how we responded in the National Seismological Service. After six minutes, we reported the first uh, location and magnitude. Uh, this was published in all our social media, Twitter and Facebook, and the web page. Um, we had more than six million impressions in our Twitter account. Um, later, a revised location, we um, estimated the ma moment magnitude. Uh, however, we got a very, very large number with really uh, strikers, and we didn't publish that result. And this was because we had the preliminary um, a result had put the, sor the source in a very shallow position. So we had to do lots of analysis on the data to better locate the earthquake. Next one. Um, so in the National Seismological Service, we produce the location and the magnitude, and we immediately send information to two agencies. One is the Institute of Engineering. Uh, they are in charge of producing the intensity maps or um, shake maps as in the US, yes. And we also send this information to the national government, um, the, the federal government agency that is the Center for National Prevention Disasters. Uh, so they put in this application the information of the location and the shake maps and start uh, making analysis and queries about the exposed population, exposed infrastructure, and so on. Next. Uh, then after uh, uh, almost 55 minutes, uh, we got uh, another review of the location and the magnitude. It was, um, we got 8.4 for a moment magnitude, and we also publish it in our social media. Then, um, almost one hour and a half later, we, we publish our first uh, preliminary report on the earthquake with all the information that we had up to that time. Uh, all this time, all the senior analysts and our researcher uh, look into the data and details on the waveforms <laughs> to finally set up the, the depth of the earthquake to 58 kilometers. Then we revise the moment magnitude and we establish it at 8.2. Um, we publish again, and of course, the number of impressions on, on our social account uh, went less. By then, the people was already sleeping. Uh, next one, please. Um, so we also have uh, something similar to the USGS, the, uh, the Did You Feel It um, reports. So those are fitted by, by people that uh, feel the shaking and submit a survey. And with that, we got this intensity map. And this is striking and not surprising that we don't have any response from the central area. And that it was very damaged um, zone. And also, they were without light or electricity or, or internet. Uh, this is the, the intensity map produced by the Institute of Engineering within the first 30 minutes after the origin time. And you can see how strong it was close to the epicenter, uh, reaching in, um, accelerations of more than 700 centimeters per, second, uh, per square second. Um, and you can see this is a, where the epicenter was, and this is Mexico City more than 600 kilometers away. Next one. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in very few hours, we already have uh, several uh, hundred uh, aftershocks. This is a map at uh, 1 p.m. the next day, local time. And you can see we already had reported 482 aftershocks. And the largest one was a few minutes after the main shock, and it was a magnitude 6.1. Uh, we located it within the slab. And uh, we could see that the, the 
the plane of the of the rupture was uh, almost a vertical along this line. Um, up to yesterday night, uh, we have reported more than 12,000, almost 13,000 aftershocks since uh, September 7. Uh, this is the regular seismicity reported by the, the uh, seismological service. We usually report in average about uh, 40 earthquakes daily, and we jump that day to more than 350 earthquakes per day. Currently, we are close to 100. Next one, please. Next slide. Uh, this is a relocation of the aftershocks of uh, almost two months. And you can delineate the, the rupture uh, plane and then one, two, and three sets of, of events. And you can observe the decay on the number of aftershocks with time of after um, 80 days. This is um, this um, set of earthquakes started in on September 23rd. This uh, was a Saturday morning, and the main shock was 6.1, triggered by the event along the, the main shock. And this is the decay um, of their own aftershocks, and this is for the other two. Next one, please. So um, we were already very active on locating all these, these aftershocks when the um, Puebla Morero earthquake happened closer to Mexico City. This was only uh, less than 120 kilometers away from Mexico City. This was very fast. When we got the, the first uh, location and magnitude, it was only five minutes after the origin time. And for this event, we got, we got uh, almost 10 million impressions in our um, Twitter account. Um, only 11 minutes um, later, we got a good um, moment magnitude, and the depth was already set to 57 kilometers depth, and the moment magnitude was 7.1. Later, almost two hours later, we had the, the uh, we published a preliminary report. So these reports are being updated as as we get more information regarding the earthquakes. Next one, please. You can find them in the in this web pages. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the first version of the intensity map. Uh, uh, it was generated a couple of hours after the earthquake. You can see that there were very few responses. And the striking part was Mexico City that is here in the center. And you notice only green and blue colors, uh, which didn't reflect what happened in the city. That could be um, um, a very um, few damage. Uh, however, Mexico City had uh, more than uh, 40 collapsed buildings, uh, 44 collapsed buildings, and 250 people um, died uh, during the earthquake. Uh, next one. So after a few hours, we um, collected more surveys, and you can see the uh, near the epicentral region is uh, yellow and red, which um, indicates severe um, intensities, and farther away are the the uh, pink ones and, and purple ones. Um, and then this is Mexico City now representing what actually happened in the, within the city with yellows and, and oranges and reds. Uh, this is the instrumental intensity map on, on the bottom and generated by the Institute of Engineering at UNAM. And you could see that Mexico City uh, show a preliminary already uh, very strong intensity. Next. Uh, another very interesting aspect of these earthquakes was the uh, observed uh, trigger seismicity. So the the main the first earthquake happened on September 7, and a few days later um, we had uh, trigger seismicity in Mexico City, and around around uh, in several other states um, here in central Mexico. Uh, this is something that had been observed before for the, the coastal earthquakes. Um, so in Mexico City alone, uh, we had reported 70 events since 2010. That's when the, the seismic network was established for Mexico City. Uh, and for this year, so we usually report about eight earthquakes within Mexico City. They are smaller than magnitude four, um, and it's only eight per year. Uh, however, this year we had reported 10 events already before the, the main shock of the September 8. But then after that, we had reported 16 events. So, and that's only like easily observable um, earthquakes. 
Then uh, for the rest of the, of the parts in central Mexico, they, they were also triggered lots of, of small events due to this earthquake. And then these ones here were not actually triggered by the September 7 event, but by the um, September 19 event. So there's a, a, a very large number of earthquakes here, a small earthquakes, uh, very close to the epicenter of the September 19 event that have been triggered. Um, next one, I think that's it. That's Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, I beg your pardon, I'm no uh, English speaker, but I will do my best. After this uh, splendid explanation about the geophysics reason of these earthquakes, I would like to show you uh, our uh, results. Uh, we are in charge of the uh, instruments uh, that it's uh, obtaining data from earthquake in Mexico City Valley, but uh, we also made some technological developments uh, related with the earthquake early warning, and I would like to show you how this system works during the uh, last September earthquakes. Uh, first, uh, is it possible to open the slide that we are seeing? My final presentation was corrupted, and we are <laughs> make, taking some file from my phone. <laughs> Sorry. It's a, a view of how, the, how it works. Uh, we, we made an installation of 100 uh, uh, strong motion recorders installed uh, uh, over the more seismic area in our country. And uh, from these uh, points, uh, during any earthquake, uh, we made an analysis of the uh, danger of the, 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 da the level of danger of this uh, earthquake, and we send warning uh, signals to towns uh, 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 with uh, risk about this uh, seismic effect. Uh, these uh, stations are um, are. Uh, looking well, sensing the uh, acceleration, and made uh, 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 qualification, the forecast of the uh, level of the earthquake in under development. And in three, three moments, uh, during three moments, this signal, I'm hearing the presentation, but it's, we need here. Uh, with these uh, algorithms, the station is sending uh, the first three seconds of information it sends uh, uh, data for the cities. The second time uh, when the earthquake is under development, uh, detect the, this S wave and then send a next uh, level of warning. And, and the, final, the final sending is when the 2S minus P occurs. And then we have from every station three uh, danger qualification. And, and every city uh, have this knowledge, and then every city can decide uh, the level of the warning depending on the distance from the station that it's calling when the earthquake occurs. Well, uh, if the earthquake is very near uh, of the town, the warning uh, take control of the every broadcast, every uh, warning services and it takes uh, it takes few uh, time few seconds to arrive to the city due to the distance short distance from the focus from the epicenter if the earthquake is arriving from so while we sorry can we figure out try to prepare the frame glass do you want to jump in and say then we'll come back no it's cool. so good so good yes okay. please Is it possible? To oh, is this screen not? Is it possible to help? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can you know, Is this screen working? Yeah, it should be. I don't think so. <laughs> All right, we'll skip that. Okay. Hello? Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to say that my colleagues here are responsible for the seismic safety of their nation. I'm just a, a, a scientific scavenger 
looking for opportunities to understand how earthquakes interact. And the big question here with two large earthquakes within 11 days and 600 kilometers of each other are, are they related? Is this a chain reaction or a coincidence? And what will happen next? So I want to show you um, what we've seen. So if we go to the first slide, you'll see a map of, of the earthquake locations. Uh, first slide, please, or the next slide. OK. So you see numbers 1, 2, and 3. 1 and 2 are 650 kilometers apart. One's in the lower right. And then that number two, 3 earthquake, Oaxaca, a 6.1, occurred 16 days after the first one. And what we are finding is that as far as we can tell, the two big earthquakes had nothing to do with each other. Or at least if they did, we, we can't see any evidence of it, whereas the first and the third were closely related. And we think that the chances of another large earthquake in the next year are now something like twice as high as what they were before. So another shoe could drop. All right, let's go to the first slide, the next slide. So here's what's missing. The stress changes at the site of the Puebla earthquake, the one that did the damage in Mexico City, conveyed from the first earthquake are so small, they're smaller than the daily tidal changes. So we don't think they matter. There's also a possibility that the seismic waves, when they blast through that area, somehow jostled the faults and ultimately, after some delay, led to an earthquake. And what we would look for as evidence of that is seismicity at Puebla, at the, the earthquake closest to Mexico City, starting to turn on after the big one. And we don't see it. So you can see here that the red line is the time of the first earthquake, and the little yellow dot at the, uh, is the second earthquake. And there's no change in seismicity at the level we can detect in the next Mexican national network. So are they coincidence? And the answer to this question is really the birthday question. Uh, this, we don't have a lot of people in the room, but my birthday is September 28th. Anybody here have a birthday of September 28th? So if we had a lot of people in the room, we would get some hands. It's the same thing here. Rather than asking who's got the same birthday, who's got a birthday within 11 days of each other, and rather than in this one room, we'd have a room 615 kilometers wide. And when you do that, the number turns out to be one chance in 200. You can go to the next slide. So the chances that these are purely coincidence are rare, but not too rare. But there's another coincidence in the room, and that is that the Puebla earthquake struck two hours after the annual earthquake drill for the country. Now, we all know that's a coincidence, right? What's the chance that the big earthquake would strike two hours after the drill, and it's almost one in a million? Go to the next slide. So we know that second one is coincidence. So we have to remember that coincidences really do happen, and these two big earthquakes could have been such a case. So the, the next just shows you how much more likely the uh, two earthquakes being a coincidence than that second case is. OK, the question going forward then is what's going to happen next? What can we say with any uh, credibility, with any confidence about how these three large earthquakes have changed the condition for failure in the immediate future? So I want to show you a calculation, next slide, of where we think the stresses should have risen and then you can see that it closely correlates with the aftershocks we've had over the last three months. And so now make the next slide, please. This is just a little deeper and next, and you can see it correlates again. Wait a minute, back one. OK, so forward one. Perfect. OK, so in the top right corner is the chance of a magnitude 7 if these two big shocks hadn't occurred, one in four. Because of these two shocks, the chances are now all in that ellipse. They're all higher by 50 to 100%. So in other words, we can't 
predict that an earthquake will occur, but we're saying the chances are much higher, and the chances of it occurring are somewhere between about 30 and 60 percent, and that's somewhere in this broad area. So that's a result of the stresses contributed by the earthquake. Now, I brought these models to make one more, perhaps more important point, and let me show it to you here. Here's an earthquake in Mexico City, but it could be anywhere in the world because for some stupid reason, we build buildings out of stacks of cubes. And cubes have a problem. They have no structural integrity. No matter how strong I make these columns and beams, this building is held up by its corners. And in an earthquake, it does this, side to side. And earthquakes also produce torsion. And you can see how weak this building is. If any one of these corners breaks, the building's coming down. And if you don't believe me that a cube has no structural integrity, look at this. Ikea house. You could stick it in the back of your station wagon and drive it home. Okay. This is the exact same building that I'm showing you, except I've just snapped in these little corner braces. Literally, they're sewing snaps. So I just pulled one out, and I snapped, snapped it back in. Look, nothing, nothing. OK, I've got a question for you. How much more do you think it costs to build this building than this building in percentages of the construction cost? It's 1 to 2 percent. In a home, it's the cost of a half bathroom. And this is the problem. And if it weren't for this problem, we wouldn't even have a seismology section at the AGU. We wouldn't even care about earthquakes. This is it. And if we can build right, earthquakes will take no lives and do no damage. And it's not hard. It's completely feasible. And what we have to do as earth scientists is figure out where the risk is high, let people know, and drive the effort to move from this building to this building. Oh, there it is. Um, while we're still waiting for the other presentation, do we want to ask Ross or Shirley some questions? Yeah. Seth Bornstein, Associated Press. So on average, worldwide, there's about one eight a year, and about... Um, Ten-ish. Ten, I was looking at the last 20-some years, it's about 14 yeah. Yeah. of seven to eights. This year, we've had one eight, this one, and only six sevens, seven and seven point oh to seven point nine, of those, you know, seven, three of them are in Mexico. Um, any idea why this is such a quiet year, except this one area? Is there? I mean, not. It's sort of an outcrop, you know, crop of the question about, you know, coincidence. But here, the rest, you know, much of the world is a lot quieter than it normally is except this one area. Is, is there any explanation, or is this more random? Well, if we looked at the rate of magnitude sixes this year versus last year, I haven't done so, but I'm pretty sure it'd be flat. It'd be the same. It isn't? It's 110 as of today. Um, I don't know if it's including the one or two today. And in general, you know, you're looking at about 140, 150 in the last, uh, and that's six and above. Yeah. And so it's, it's less too. Okay, so there is going to be some variation. Generally, as you go down in magnitudes, it becomes less and less variable. And basically, you're throwing dice when it comes to the really big earthquakes. So whether or not this, is, this uh, cessation of earthquakes this year is meaningful is really an open question. You know, we also had a 7.8 off in the Aleutians. No one was there. So part of it is our, our, our awareness of earthquakes has to do with the damage they do to people and not their occurrence. But that variation 
has been studied by some very thoughtful people, and it's very hard to show that it's different from chance. It could be something else, but that's the most likely explanation. But I understand that part, but that one chant, but then the few you have are all focused in one, you know, you've got such a high focus there. Is that just chance upon chance? I will say there are two types of chances, the temporary chance and especially chance. So I would put a chance in the spatial distribution. So it's not chance on chance, but there are two factors there. Juan Manuel, do you want to go ahead and present? And then we'll resume Thanks. questions. Thanks so much. Um, you have the, now we have uh, the examples. It's a, a lecture of the effects uh, gathered in the, during the 8.2 earthquake, the 7th September in Mexico. Um, here, um, take care with the sound because, well, this is the uh, system operating. The earthquake starts here, f far away under the sea, in the sea, and then some stations near in the coast start detecting the earthquake. And here we have the seismic effect uh, propagation. And this is the P wave, the most uh, uh, high speed. This is the shear wave, uh, touching Oaxaca city. And the effect is growing because it's a big earthquake. And then the warning uh, reached a uh, federal level. Uh, it opened uh, now. We have uh, 41, 40 seconds. Uh, after the earthquake was triggered. And then here we have some data sent by every station under the effect of this uh, earthquake propagation, uh, earthquake effect propagation. All this data is uh, received automatically fr from the analysis made in every station. And uh, this uh, earthquake takes more than 100 uh, seconds uh, to reach Mexico. It's very impressive, uh, the time of, uh, offered by this uh, uh, earthquake in, the, in accordance with the detection of these sensors. And uh, many, many people in Mexico City think about some failure of the earthquake early warning because uh, the effect takes uh, two minutes to hit Mexico City. At that time, we have uh, uh, the effects uh, reaching Mexico, and we uh, obtain a set of data uh, very useful, but uh, the next, uh, we can stop the, this uh, reproduction. Thank, thanks a lot. Can we see the, the next uh, slide, please? This is an automatic bulletin uh, generated by the system. Once uh, the system uh, warn, uh, generate this uh, automatically, generate this uh, table information with the uh, cities warned, the level of the warning uh, uh, reaches, and uh, uh, the hour and the distance uh, from the, uh, the uh, station that warns, and uh, seconds uh, the that uh, brings of, of the opportunity obtained with this uh, warning. It uh, occurs at night, uh, mid, uh, practically at the end of the day seven of September. And well, this is one, uh, the, the larger earthquake uh, occurred uh, during, in Mexico in recent years. We are, we are operating this system since uh, 25 years ago. And this is the, the most uh, strong effect detected and warned. The next, please. Uh, here we have the, the information that was uh, explained by, by Sholi Perez. Uh, the earthquake occurs in this point, And this is some uh, acceleration records uh, obtained from these stations. Uh, here we have the effect of this uh, strong earthquake. And these lines represent the time of warning. 
and the other uh, effects uh, obtained in every city uh, uh, permits to, to the, the estimation of the time of war, uh, opportunity to to do something. It is uh, this uh, uh, result. If, if you like, you, I can sh show you the, uh, the the next earthquake, please. The next slide. This occurs in Puebla a uh, few days, 12 days later, and uh, very near of Mexico City. The, the time of uh, warning was very small, 19 seconds for Mexico City. But the earthquake occurs here. Here we have one green dot in service. From, it's a sensor from the system. And here is the same uh, effect. It's the, the P wave is hitting Mexico City, and then uh, it was warned. Many people explain, I, I felt the, the earthquake, and then uh, the warning sound. That's true because the earthquake is coming from 60, more or less 60 kilometers deep in this area, and then while the effect touched the sensor and the surface and the epicentral area, is traveling in Mexico City, and then the, the time was so small. Uh, this uh, warning take, uh, brings uh, to Oaxaca City more than 60 seconds. Uh, it's, uh, the, this effect is reaching Oaxaca near 60 seconds, with, with 60 seconds of advantage. This uh, is uh, 30 times slower than the 8.2 effect, seismic magnitude, but the damage in Mexico City due to the uh, distance between the epicentral to Mexico City is, uh, was so impressive. This uh, system uh, needs uh, another, another uh, compromise from the authorities. The civil protection must uh, teach the population how to apply this few time, few seconds to do something useful for his uh, reduce the vulnerability of the population. And uh, the results depend uh, a lot about the, the hour of the occurrence this earthquake occurs at noon in Mexico City, and the other one occurs at night. Then uh, at night we have no child in the school. Uh, the, during this uh, nighting earthquake, we have uh, uh, labor time, and then a lot of people is out of uh, their homes. And well, the scenario, the vulnerability scenario, changed too much. The, the, we have in charge the opportunity to detect and warn, but the uh, a small part of this process of uh, uh, risk prevention, the, the you must uh, have a, a lot of uh, care about how uh, to do when the earthquake warning sounds. And this is uh, our, our job. Uh, we are uh, in charge of this uh, resource and we are uh, asking for the authorities to grow the net of sensors uh, mainly over Chiapas, mainly over the uh, Isthmus, uh, Tehuantepec Isthmus, to try to detect uh, with be better opportunity the uh, seismic occurrence and one with uh, uh, as much as early as possible to, to have time to do something. It's a part of our, our work in Mexico area. Um, we start doing these uh, efforts uh, after the 1985 earthquake. We, we are handling a, a big set of instruments. Every data are public uh, is shared with the academic uh, uh, researchers in, uh, interested in made uh, better uh, qualifications for the uh, construction, civil construction codes. That's uh, part of our mission, and it's uh, great to, to be here to try to explain you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll um, back up for questions. Is it on? Is it on now? 
One second. Okay, there we go. Hi, uh, Sarah Kaplan from the Washington Post. Um, Ross, I didn't quite follow the um, mechanism that is that you said is the fact that these two quakes have now increased the likelihood of a third quake next year. What what's the link between those two things? So, so an earthquake. Hello. Okay. So an earthquake drops the stress on the fault that slips, but it increases the stress in some areas around it. And that increases the occurrence of earthquakes, and the principal evidence of that is aftershocks. They are the sign that an earthquake doesn't just drop the stress or else there'd be no aftershock. So it has to increase it, and increases it in certain areas around it. And so what we're doing is just calculating that by treating the earth as a stiff block of rubber, we go in and we, we cut the rubber basically where the fault is. We displace the two sides, glue it back together, and the rubber's distorted. And where those distortions occur is kind of where we expect more earthquakes. So earthquakes tend to beget earthquakes in that sense. They also drop the stress in some areas and therefore drop the earthquake rates. We call those stress shadows. But the net effect is an increase, and that's why we would propose to see a higher rate of large earthquakes. Uh, Ellen Prager, I'm freelance. Uh, Ross, you, with the three earthquakes and then if there's another one, would you consider that a phenomenon of clustering of earthquakes? And if it is, well, can you make any remarks on if you think it's an intrins intrinsic factor causing the clustering or something extrinsic? extrinsic? Well, I wish I knew. <laughs> you know, and, and essentially there's only two ways in which earthquakes uh, communicate with each other. One is by these permanent changes in stress, uh, thinking about the Earth as basically a, a blob of rubber. And one is by the transmission of the seismic waves that was shown so beautifully in this animation. So when those waves go through, they have very large stresses, but they don't stay. They're transient. And they, not, they stress the faults toward failure, and they stress them the other way, because they oscillate. So, What's peculiar is if this clustering phenomena were, were clearly related to what we call the dynamic stress, the, these waves which head out, then we would expect to see the earthquakes occur immediately. But generally they don't, they're delayed. Uh, and so that delay is mysterious to us. We don't understand why they don't occur immediately. Maybe they cause very, very little earthquakes we can't see, and some of those cascade into something larger. So clustering is a phenomena that is probably a part of earthquake occurrence, although a lot of random things look clustered. You look up in the stars, they look clustered, but basically they're separate galaxies that aren't interacting. So, you know, this is one of the things we're just trying to figure out. Hello, uh, this is Ramin Skeba, freelance. Um, I have a question for Shioli Perez Campos. Um, I wanted to follow up on the point you said earlier about a, a temporal chance versus a spatial chance. Um, I was wondering, I guess, <laughs> to what extent you agreed with Ross Stein's point um, about um, whether these quakes are a coincidence. Like, to, to what extent was the second quake unexpected, in your view? Uh, it, it was completely unexpected. It was just a coincidence. Yeah. OK. OK. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay, do we have any more questions from reporters in the room? Do we have a question on the chat? Let, let me just follow up with, with a, an answer to Shirley's question. You know, in science, you're right until you're proved absolutely wrong. Somebody tomorrow may come up with evidence that shows these are earthquakes are connected in ways we don't see. And that's certainly possible as more evidence comes along, such as if there was a broad distortion of the crust over this huge area uh, that would be measured by GPS or some other phenomena. So I think our position is, Look, right now we have no evidence that they're related to each other, but somebody may come up with something. Yeah, I, actually, I should say that the very first day I got this same question. Probably that was the first question I got in every interview. And I was very cautious to say, at this moment, we don't know. We need to process the data, wait for Ross's results, <laughs> and see what he or others come up with. And so I, I start following all the, the different researchers, and all of them say, no, they are not related uh, mm -hmm. up to this point. 
So mm -hmm. that, that's what my answer now was very fast. But if you had done the same question two months ago, it, it wouldn't happen. OK, we have a question from the web chat. Go ahead. This is for um, Juan Manuel. This is from Rick Lovett, who's a freelancer. Mm -hmm. This is, how many lives do you estimate that the early warning system saves? It's a very complex uh, question because it depends of the moment of the earthquake, uh, depends of the conditions of the users of the information. If you are sleeping, if you are working, it changes a lot the, the results. But uh, Mexico City Valley is a very populated region of my country. We estimate under 20 million people living in the uh, metropolitan area, uh, Toluca State, well, the state of Mexico, the state of federal district, and other uh, towns in the, uh, near of, uh, this valley. That's uh, the reason it's not possible to to bring the, the some figure of the better result. Nowadays, for instance, we are sharing a warning uh, radio message in, in the valley of uh, Oaxaca, Oaxaca State. The capital is in, in a small valley and uh, the, we are sending a uh, uh, warning there and they are using a big uh, loudspeakers uh, towers to warn in, Mexico, in the uh, Oaxaca Valley. But they are uh, in spite of this, is a very advantage uh, option. Uh, Oaxaca people living there is near less than 20 percent of the pop uh, state population. Then we must grow the, the systems to warn every town as smaller as uh, there will be, uh, but with uh, other kind of uh, not sound for. Every well, we can install loudspeakers speakers in every uh, county and every municipality, trying to bring the the, the sound. Them uh, there are there are other options uh, through telephone line, but there are very poor uh, towns in Oaxaca. They have no telephone services. It's a it's a process growing. This must be uh, uh, under development, continuous to try to ma make more perfect this. And then, by now, it's very complex to uh, uh, have the uh, advantage figure of this warning uh, information. Um, we, we have uh, the best scenario for us is to apply this for a school sector, uh, that if we reach the schools in our country with the warning er uh, seismic er er uh, early warning, we, we have um, the opportunity to save childs in labor time in the schools. But if they are in vacations, if they are in their home sleeping, the scenario changes drastically. Yes, and uh, now uh, recently Mexico City area, the federal district, uh, they start growing this system uh, in, in 1989. We start operating with the authorities of Mexico City area. They uh, we start growing there the system, and we are sending. A warning, general warning, if the earthquake in the Guerrero Coast uh, go over six uh, magnitude, six, it must be warned in Mexico City. But if the earthquake occurring in the coast is lower than 5.5, .5, we warn just uh, schools, uh, some services. We stop the metro, we stop uh, some uh, services, technical services, without the share this knowledge to the population. And then, well, it's a process growing, and recently the authorities opened uh, loudspeakers, a great, great amount of loudspeakers in our city since 
2015, they opened the, the warning. Uh, that, that, that means you, you don't need to have a, a radio, you don't need to have a telephone to know the warning because it uh, is here uh, in, the, in the street because there are four, uh, near 14,000, no, one, one, 14,000 um, loudspeakers posts around the city sharing the, the warning zone. Uh, all the all day, uh, when it occurs, uh, you can hear the the warning in the space of, of the metropolitan area. Okay, that's our time. So thank you so much to our panelists. We're gonna con that's gonna conclude our press conference. So we will reconvene at one thirty uh, about with subsidence in coastal Louisiana.